what's up welcome to nostalgia dave here another podcast what's going on in pop culture right now got a bunch of great stuff to talk about the bear season two one of the best shows of last year one of the biggest surprises of last year is back with season two and it is excellent also talking 2022 emmy nomination predictions before the emmy noms come out on july 12th a unexpected new release from Lil Uzi Vert, The Pink Tape, has come out at last after years of being teased. Gotta get into that. Also, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, the fifth and final Indiana Jones film, is out and it's actually pretty good. And also, HBO's The Idol has mercifully exited stage left, and we gotta talk about that. There's a ton to get into with that one. So make sure you subscribe, youtube.com slash nostalgia pod, linktree.com slash nostalgia pod. Get the pod any way you can. Make sure you get it. Links are below. Hit the Spotify playlist, best of 2023 for my favorite songs of the year, updated weekly. And let's get into it. What's up, Wild Mountain Nostalgia? Dave here with a review of Little Uzi Vert's new album, question mark, Pink Tape. Uh, this is being billed as Uzi's second third third official uh full-length album but it's really a mixtape it's very long it's like 90 minutes long 26 tracks so it's for all intensive purposes a mixtape even if it's commercially being presented and pitched by the label as an album regardless this is a project this is a mixtape that uzi has been teasing for a long time he first gave us the title of this song two years ago uh you know i in general, I think Uzi has been a huge figurehead in like the recent leak culture, snippet culture of music fandom that's kind of popped back up in the age of TikTok and Instagram stories and kind of bringing back uh, an affinity and attention for music leaks when it comes to uh, fandom. Uzi's at the front of that, you know, alongside someone like Playboy Cardi. And Uzi's pink tape is a really expansive bloated listen but thematically genre wise it's interesting because Uzi is really positioning himself himself as one of the new faces of this new version of like rap rock that we have today in 2023 I think we have to look Back to, back to last fall, when Just Wanna Rock came out last October, one of the biggest hip-hop hits of the past, you know, six months, past year, really. And Just Wanna Rock is a Jersey Club song. And if you think about this new era we have with Cardi and Uzi, production from people like Too Rare, the rage music side of things with people like Yeet, Uzi's proximity to that rage music pushing it forward into this kind of rap rock you get on pick tape it really kind of feels like the natural progression of the soundcloud rap music that popped up you know seven eight years ago it is interesting to kind of trace the lineage of all of this i've been a big uzi fan for quite a while he's kind of sneakily been in our lives for a long time at this point like what seven eight years and despite all that you know i think pink tape it's just way too long and way too much, but I think that's kind of the point that this is too much. It's all different kinds of songs. It's traditional hip-hop, traditional Uzi sound. It's rap rock. It's a bit of pop punk. It's covers. It's interpolations. It's kind of all over the place. It is truly throwing paint at the wall, pink paint at the wall, and seeing what sticks. And to use Uzi's words... If you're having, if you're feeling blue, have a pink day. Having a blue day, have a pink day instead. Whatever he said, I get it. It makes sense. And yeah, I think there's a lot of things to like, like I think songs to take away. And I think because Pink Tape is 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 truly presented as a mixtape project, it's okay that it's all over the place and has no form of self editing at all. Like it's not a project to listen to in that manner. Take the songs out you like, ignore the rest. You know, I think. Something like Eternal Take from Uzi back in 2020, much more cohesive, much more, uh, I think, revisitable to me as a full-length project. And Uzi gave us the Red and White EP last year, which I think I liked actually quite a bit. And 
part of the, part of that's the brevity. Pink tape is a lot. That being said, there's things I like about it. He's also teased. Uzi's also teased that should Pink Tape go number one, Uzi will release Love Is Rage Two. Now he's done these kind of teases in the past. We'll see. You know, lest we forget, Eternal Take was quickly followed up with Little Uzi Reverse the World Two as a sort of like deluxe version project. We know from Uzi's words and uh, as well as Don Cannon's words. Hundreds of songs have been recorded for Pink Tape and for other projects that are in just in that Uzi fall. And that's why what makes Uzi so uh, potent a uh, mix for, you know, leaks and snippets and stuff, because there's just so much material, right? Uh, but Pink Tape, you know, I think really the main takeaway is just that it's really quite all over the place and quite jumping around sound to sound, vibe to vibe. And Uzi does certain types of songs better than others i think that's obvious but the i think unexpectedness of what was next in the song makes pink tape a fun listen even if ultimately it's a bit long and has some clunkers and right off the bat uh flooded the face kind of a fun rap flow from uzi a really strong bass on that one i like that then track two completely different song suicide doors you know suicide doors the opening like uh sample of uh i forget the guy's name shitting on uzi's uh sound and music making and belittling him with a homophobic bent at that put all that away goes into the actual music you have uzi's uh energy super high and these guitars just come out of nowhere you know it definitely fits the rage vibe i think the the beat is very dark very ominous almost a drill-esque beat um i thought the hook was a little weak though you know, uh, the next song, I, I like Uzi's part of that. I think it's kind of just that fun, playful flow you get from Uzi uh, from time to time when he's rapping. But Travis Scott feature was quite weak, in my opinion. Uh, Crush him, the, f- the first verse, the flow, very, very reminiscent of Myron from Uzi, which I like quite a bit. Although, I th- again, I think the, the hook was very repetitive, almost to the point where it's like intentionally setting up like dance breaks when it comes to live performance. Not my favorite type of stuff. Uh, X2 is, I think, pretty interesting as well. I like. I think he has a funny quotable. Is it um, Montana Bay? Call that Billy Ray. I like that word play. The vocal changes from Uzi. Quite a lot of range on that one. It's nice. Uh, let's see. I Gotta, further down. I love the flow from Uzi. The bass, kind of a processional, almost vibe to the beat. Pretty fun. Endless Fashion. Nicki Minaj feature. Big track, hyped about track. Nicki has said the creative process behind this song was a lot of work, funny enough. That one is quite interesting to me just because I think it's an earworm. I think it's fun. I've been revisiting it a lot. And that's probably because it's interpolating Eiffel 65's I'm Blue. Once again, new pop songs are in fact old pop songs. This is a huge trend right now when it comes to making pop music. Uzi's done this before. Think about uh, That Way. The Backstreet Boys flip from uh, Eternal Take on Uzi's side. Nikki just had a huge hit doing something like this with Red Ruby to Sleaze, right? Uh, Eiffel 65's I'm Blue. This has already been done with this song last year with the BB Rexa song. Uh, you know, the I'm good, yeah, I'm feeling all right shit. Like, uh, Coil Ray just ma- made a whole album doing stuff like this. Noticeable samples and big interpolations and grafting those with a new song and new verses and things like that. It's a definitely very in vogue right now. I think Endless Fashion, though, is a really good use of that. It's quite fun. So I support it in this instance. You know, I think uh, further down the track list, you have CS, which is actually just Uzi doing a cover of System of a Down's Chop Suey. I think that one's a lot less effective, and that's really just more of a traditional cover. Um, let's see what else here. Mama, I'm Sorry. I think that one's really fun. The Uzi hook is like softer spoken performance from Uzi. I think that one sounds really good. Um, All Alone, uh, let's see. I I like that one. Nakamura I thought was really uh, interesting and immediately ear grabbing. Uh, I believe it's like a direct sample of a wrestler theme song, Nakamura, like super cool. Of course, Just Wanna Rock is here. Uh, Let's see, what else? Fire Alarm, another one I thought was really good. You have Werewolf with Bring Me to Horizon, literally just making, you know, metalcore, really tough punk song. 
a la Bermuda Horizon. Not something you'd expect from Uzi, although that band and Uzi have actually collaborated in the past. I don't think this song's super effective as an Uzi song or Bring Me the Horizon song that much. kind of feels like a mismatch. But the fact that he's trying something like that, I guess that's cool. I think that's kind of what you have to celebrate about Uzi doing all these kinds of things. Is he's going to, again, throw some of these darts. And that is a big, big high-profile uh, collab right there. I think Days Come and Go definitely kind of grabs you from the... Uh, subject matter from Uzi going right into rehab which I think is a really great song to listen to but also Uzi going into the fact that he had a successful seventh month rehab stint recently I like that one um the end with baby metal on the feature kind of gives you like an anime like theme song chorus type vibe interesting once again in general like eight Asian references are all over this project from Uzi and then you have these three bonus tracks. I think Zoom, that one's great because that one feels, without a shadow of a doubt, like it's from like 2017 era Uzi. Really love that one. Um, and Sade, the last track, I thought also sounded pretty good. So like, that's a lot of songs, right? 90 minutes of music. I noticed, I noted a bunch that I like, right? Like, there's a lot to enjoy about this. And that's what's, I think, just fun about Uzi is he's an energetic artist and personality. And you get that in the music. And even if I definitely like, I think more traditional Uzi is my favorite Uzi, just the same way like 2016 Playboy Cardi is my favorite Cardi, not a whole lot of Red Cardi. Like I'm not a huge rage music guy, all things considered. I do appreciate the artistry that's coming into what Uzi's giving you on Pink Tape and just the desire to do different things and do them all at the same time as well so that's pretty cool very curious what love is rage 2 actually is if it is to come out soon as uzi is teasing is that more of more songs from these recent sessions is it throwback stuff from the vault a mix of both probably a mix of both i don't know but yeah shout out little uzi vert this is one of the i think most fun hip-hop artists there is you know has he has he hit the highs of exo tour life on pink tape no just want to rock's a big hit, but no. That's okay. He's an exciting artist. But let me know how'd you feel about Uzi. What did you think of Pink Tape? Obviously, there's a lot of thoughts to be had. And for more rap reviews and more music reviews, subscribe. And I'll see you next time. What's up? Welcome back to Nostalgia. Dave here with a review of The Idol full season on HBO. Starring Lily Rose Depp and The Weeknd from Sam Levinson and A24 on HBO, five episodes out in full, going to go into full spoilers, but yeah, there's a lot to get into with The Idol. I think that is abundantly obvious to anyone who watched the entire season. There's been a lot of stuff lately as well about, was there supposed to be six episodes instead of just the five we got? Did something happen there? Was this a miniseries the whole time? Was it supposed to be have a season two? Has it been canceled? Was it always a miniseries? There's a lot of back and forth on that we'll find out the fate of the show in due time but there's a lot to get into you know the idol was something that i was intrigued about from the start and of course once we heard about the controversy and the polarization around the initial reception to the show especially in the wake of the idol basically scrapping a 80 percent complete version of the show made by amy simons and bringing levinson in and having the weekend have more creative control there's a lot going into the idol and you know, the very negative can reception, I think definitely got some people's eyebrows up and maybe even got them more interested in the series because what was being said about the show was certainly not something you hear all the time. And I talked about the first episode when it came out. I'm going to talk about the whole series now and go, obviously got to spoil it, but I'll just say that it's a show I wanted to like because there's an aspect of the show, a version of the show that I do like. And was very interested and engaged by. And in general, I think the show looks good and has good performances on it, despite the notable omission everyone knows, uh, notable exception everyone knows. But despite all that, I just think this show was not interested in portraying and getting into the aspect of itself that I was most interested in. What Sam Levinson and The Weeknd wanted to do with this show disappointed me. 
to, to, to be blunt, because I think a different version of the show was really cool, and there was definitely a place for that. And basically what that difference is, is I think it's really abundantly obvious to everyone, but like you get from the very first part of the idol, beginning of episode one, that first 20 minutes, it positions itself as a really engaging satirization of pop music and the music industry in general. You know, you have Jocelyn, play by Lily Rose Depp, pretty obvious stand-in for like a Britney Spears type figure in pop. And she has this whole team around her, various people, management and label and uh, touring industry, you know, and they're played by an amazing cast. Jane Addams, Divine Joy Randolph, Hank Azaria, Eli Roth, Dan Levy makes a cameo in the first episode, didn't realize that would be his only appearance, but it was. Creative directors played by Troy Sivan, her best friend and assistants played by Rachel Sennett. The cast is there. And in general, the performances right, right there are there. And I just think, like, if this show was interested in porch going down that road and, like, seeing, like, Jocelyn navigate her way through the music industry, and if you think about that, like, they almost tease an aspect to this later on where, like, Jane Addams' uh, label exec character, and I think Jane Addams' great performance throughout the season really lent her. She's having a great time. She starts to lose faith in Jocelyn's ability to deliver creatively and gives one of those uh, singles they're about to release, gives it to Diane, this dancer character that's worked with Jocelyn that they know, and Diane is played by Jenny Kim from Blackpink. And that, I think, would have been really interesting to see that played out more, with like Jocelyn navigating some ups and downs creatively, bring someone into her life, Tedros played by The Weeknd, bring someone into her life to inspire her in these um, unusual ways. Uh, of course, we get into all that with the idol. Just supposing that with Diane, this character who's not really a musician, at least not not yet, and is the label going to find a way to make this person who's an engaging dancer into an artist and put those two characters against each other, these former friends? I don't know. Like I just think there was a lot of meat on the industry bone with this show. And that's not what Levinson and The Weeknd wanted to do at all. They wanted this to be super voyeuristic because that's what this show is about at the end of the day. It's about watching The Weeknd push Lily Rose Depp to the brink and that's what that's what we're watching here we're watching really extended graphic sex scenes and i'm not a prude about that at all i don't care about that we're watching a lot of lines being pushed you know uh edgy shit but it's just i think it's really gratuitous like, there's a lot of nudity which is again that's one thing but like it just feels like the show didn't have enough like to say in the moments that aren't just like gratuitous over long nude scenes that there just wasn't enough there there. And again, I'm disappointed because I felt like there was something there if you just went down that industry angle instead. That's not what they did. If you did a huge course correction with a season two, I would be interested to see it. But I, I don't think it's going to get renewed. And even if it did, I just don't think The weekend and Sam Levinson would suddenly decide to do a huge creative course correction. Um on top of that, you have this, I think, kind of bizarre finale with the Idol, episode five, where there's this really like 11th hour twist where it's revealed that Jocelyn was actually in control the whole time. We watched the first four hours of the show watching this obvious overt manipulation on the part of Tedros, who clearly is being this Fengali character and moving his way into her orbit, bringing his cult of artists and people into her home and seemingly using her for personal gain and and for for fun and entertainment and all these things and of course for sex god knows she we know he was using her for sex seeing all that right and it seems like it's so obvious and the jocelyn is just like so broken and it, it, it's setting itself up to be a tragic situation or maybe jocelyn can uh rise up above it and kick Tedros out. That's how the finale starts. And I think it's really engaging when she starts to just kind of um, push back against him and redraw those boundaries. But this 11th hour twist is revealing that Joss was in fact in control the whole time and was letting uh, Tedros push her to the absolute brink sexually, 
pain tolerance wise, et cetera, doing all this because she knew she needed that push creatively to get to the next level artistically. I don't know. I'm sorry. I think that's just way too big of a leap. Like that's just not an effective twist because it's not what we had got in the first four episodes. It just feels like it's out of nowhere. I think a big part of this would be like, I mean, we know that this show was chopped up and redone. If I didn't know that, I'd probably have more faith in like believing in this vision. I think another aspect of this too is like, the show doesn't give you enough time with like Jocelyn's uh, pain of losing her mother about a year ago and like having this huge creative rut and, and general like mental health ongoing struggle. Like we're told all that, but the show doesn't really build on that that much. And also, The Weeknd is not a good enough actor to really, I think, communicate any like layer of depth with Tedros. Like, I don't know. I wouldn't call like The Weeknd distracting as an actor. Like, he's not a good actor. He's he's a, he's a singer, a great singer, obviously. I, I'm a big fan of his. But it wasn't so much that he was distracting. Just he wasn't able to elevate the material. And this script just isn't there to help you believe in the twist that you get in the finale. It's very perplexing to me. Um, and That being said, there's things I enjoyed. Like I said, the industry angle, when it was there, I was, I was into. Episode two, I really liked um, the scene with Joss is doing the music video and there's take after take after take. And she's like trying to get it right, trying to get it right. Like, I, I enjoyed that. You know, something I didn't like was just the excessive dirty talk from Tedros at the end of episode two because the weekend is just super cringy when he's laying that out. And another aspect of this show, you have got in the press since it's been airing, the weekend said this, Levinson said this, like Tedros is supposed to be a joke. And he's definitely made out to be a joke in the finale. But the idol's point of view on Tedros when you're watching the beginning and, and middle of the series doesn't make it super clear that they are positioning him as a joke the entire time. Because it's just so, so dark. And also, Tedros is so self-serious about everything. Like, there are funny aspects about it. And obviously, like, the audience views him negatively, like, the entire time. But I just don't know if tonally, like, that stuff is landing and actually in the text, despite what they're telling me in the press. I don't know. Um, episode 3, I like the Valentino scene when they go shopping. I love uh, Haim's interrogation uh, scene. Uh, the weekend's pronunciation of carte blanche um for how he says it but he says it wrong i thought that was really funny um tedros having that conversation with troy savant's character diane making that progress the dinner scene the hairbrush scene that was incredibly upsetting right episode three it's solid um episode four getting into like that tedros like creative process stuff again seeing mike dean the producer himself playing himself come in the Troy Sivan shock collar stuff that was very difficult to watch, but I really like watching Divine Joy Randolph like do her sleuthing in the mansion and get to the bottom of things um, in her own way. That was great. Um, I, Troy Sivan's character though just kind of becomes part of the cult. Like the shock collar shit just worked, and he's broken, and now he's just in it and 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 part of the gang. Like. I think we skipped a few steps with how that was communicated. I thought Tri Zavon, who is a a singer that I'm not a big fan of, I think he's okay, but I actually thought he was really great acting on this show. He's definitely the best musician acting on this show. I think you know you have Troy, you have Jenny, and you have The Weeknd. I didn't. I'm a huge Jenny and Blackpink fan. I didn't really love Jenny on this show. She doesn't have a whole lot to do, but like the performance is like really understated like i think she could have used a bit more direction in terms of how she acted although of course the dancing stuff was great we know she can do that and the weekend just because of the abundance of screen time um it really stands out that he's not actually an actor um yeah you know i think episode five the the showcase they do at joss's house where like josh and all the other musicians and Susanna san's character moses sumney's character doing their performances and getting everyone on board, the label people, Eli Roth coming back in, giving you some great one-liners. Like he refers to Moses Sumney as like a really hot Targaryen. I thought that was hilarious. Um, that scene is really cool, especially because Tedros is like super, hair super encamped. You can tell he's like losing it. I really like all that, but I just think like the, 
the twist at the end kind of ruined it for me. Gotta say. So the idol, I wanted to like it, and I certainly gave it the benefit of the doubt. I watched the whole thing, but uh, I think it's just kind of a big misfire. And yeah, it's a lot of what could have been to me. You know, I think if this show, if this show creatively had a different priority with how it was made, it could have been really good. And that's despite the fact that you could have kept the weekend and his poor acting in. And I think this could have just been more interesting. But there just wasn't enough, I think, to this show to kind of carry you through just a lot of like gratuitous scenes that don't actually go anywhere. And like, you can't make a show on vibes alone whether they're really dark vibes or not. So Idol is a bit of a miss for me. I'm still a Sam Levinson fan overall. I think he's an interesting creator for good and bad. Um, you know, this is not euphoria, though. That much is obvious. So I'd be expecting the show to get canceled, given all the polarization, given the big cost the first season had, because they redid the whole thing. Um, given, you know, given the environment we're in and Warner Bros. Discovery is in a big cost-cutting uh, mode of operation these days. The show rated okay. It's not like it was a, a total flop or anything, but it also didn't rate nearly as well as a big hit like Euphoria does, obviously. So I think it's kind of an easy, they'll cut the, cut cut their losses and say they're happy with how it came out and just move on. That's what I would guess would happen. Lily Rose Depp, this is kind of her first big role. She's been in some supporting stuff um, in the past. I liked her as Jocelyn. You know, I, I think the script doesn't do her the best amount of favors from time to time, but I would like to see her uh, continue to do more things. She's obviously still very young, so we'll see something. And I think I, I think I've seen enough of the the weekend acting. Like he, he's not Drake. Like Drake's a much better actor than the weekend. <laughs> and actually, who knows how the idol turned out if it was Drake instead? Great, great question. Um, but yeah, let me know. How did you feel about the idol? Did you like it more than me? Did you get hung up on the stuff I got hung up on? Somewhere in between. And for more movie reviews, for Blackpink reviews and the weekend reviews when those come up subscribe and i'll see you next time what's up welcome back to nostalgia dave here with a review of the bear season two yes chef the bear is back fx hulu series the surprise of 2022 when it comes to tv i think that's pretty much consensus at this point the bear came out of completely nowhere to make top five lists top 10 lists for everyone certainly for me uh, i thought the show was absolutely tremendous the way it debuted and the surprise was really special and now the show is back after just one year and to the surprise of exactly nobody the bear is still excellent i think the bear season two is really really great you could make a case it's even better than season one i think it's a really natural progression levels up in a bunch of different areas doesn't reinvent what it was but also avoids that sophomore slump very impressive. Love the series. Went from eight episodes to ten episodes with season two. I'm going to spoil everything, but just so you know, really loved it. Come back when you have watched it and let, leave a comment. Let me know how you're feeling about the bear season two. But yeah, love the show. Uh, the show from Christopher Store, you know, creator, writer, director. You know, I think what makes the bear so great ever since season one is that this is a show that, you know, portrays the perils and tension and never-ending stress of working in the kitchen working in the restaurant industry and it does that incredibly effectively but it's not actually a show about cooking it's not if not a food show even though when it does the food stuff it does it quite well this is a show about character and specifically loss and grief and tragedy and mental health and, and purpose like the the character moments and the character growth outside the kitchen is what you're actually invested in with these characters because they're so richly drawn and written you've been we've been invested since season one and the, the journey that like our core characters go on is something you really care about and i think that's what makes the bear so special is that its priorities i think are just a bit higher minded and and, and more um more interesting than if this was just a more simpler show. I'm sure the bear would still be very entertaining if it was much more pure, the grind of kitchen uh, life. You know, season two is really all about, you know, following season one finale when they find Mikey's money in the tomato cans. The bear crew wants to, needs to 
make a new restaurant, but they want to do it the right way and they want to go for like a Michelin star and do like a fine dining experience and reinvent the bear. And they have a lot of things going against them in terms of financial constraints, uh, race against the clock, uh, infrastructure issues with their location, et cetera, et cetera. If the show is just focused on that, that's plenty dramatic and plenty interesting enough that with the great ensemble that you have with the cast, it would still be a great show. But when you step outside that that core structure and you spend time with the characters doing other things, that's where like the bear really blossoms what makes it so special. I think this is easily top top two, top three show of the year thus far. I'd say it's, you know, succession in the bear. You know, I love beef, I love The Last of Us, but I think Succession and the Bear are the top two shows of the year thus far. And of course, come back later when at the end of the year when I do my top ten, we'll find out what I thought then. But right now I think it's one of the best series. So yeah, I think um you know the cast also, of course, it, it needs it needs those flowers, right? Jeremy Allen White kinda coming out of nowhere in season one, even though he had been a member of the Shameless Ensemble for almost ten years. But this is a you know tour de force performance. In general, uh, season one, we expect to do well at the Emmys. We'll figure out what it gets nominated for in a few weeks. But and Jeremy Allen White, really tremendous, really carrying, you know, I think, a lot with the Carmi character. And we learn more about Carmi's backstory and his past. And you find out why he struggles with so much when it comes to the pressure and tension of his life, but also just the way he acts and carries himself. Allen White really delivers on that regard and it's just an amazing performance um Io Idibiri, you know she's been around a while both you know, as a writer on what we do in the shadows a supporting actor and the comedic side of things but she also clearly blossoms in this role as sydney uh amazing and then emma moss Backrat again as a richie he's someone who's worked a ton you see him all the time i mean in the past year alone he's done two seasons in the bear a great run on andor and some other stuff you know he's he's a busy guy but this you know as richie really blowing off the screen, you know, blowing the top, if you will, especially in season one. Like the, the fact that those three performances are so, I think, finely tuned from a writing perspective and then accurately rendered by the actors really makes this show shine. And then even the supporting characters, right? Lionel Boyce, El Boy from Odd Future back in the day. Amazing as Marcus in a supporting role. You know, uh, Oliver Platt as Cicero is, is great. Um, uh, Carmi's character Sugar uh, gets a whole lot more to do as a character in season two to great effect. Uh, Tina uh, has even more going on in season two. I think, you know, it just, and of course, season one has one of the great cameos in recent memory with John Bernthal in a flashback sequence as uh, Carmi's deceased brother Mikey. Bernthal giving you absolutely everything with, with such limited screen time. Um, blowing you off the screen. And of course, season two, perhaps the most talked about moment of season two would be episode six, Fishes, where which is a five years in the past flashback to a, a family Christmas. And you learn really more about Karm, why Karm is the way he is in terms of uh, how he acts socially and how uh, fucked up he is based off his family. And Bernthal returns as Mikey and is absolutely amazing once again. And I'll get into the other people that show up uh, for the first time in, in that episode. But the Burnthaw like less is more, but also like comes out of the bullpen and just throws 105 miles an hour and gets three strikeouts type role that he has on this show is amazing. And I would not be shocked at all if we get another flashback episode with, with featuring him in season three. And I'm sure they'll make a season three because this show is just so critically adored and also seems to be a pretty solid ratings hit as far as Hulu and FX is concerned. I think my only gripe with this is I would love if this show was a bit more parsed out. You know, you get the full binge, the full season released all at once. Even if they release this maybe three episode chunks or something, it would just be awesome to sustain the conversation of the show over a long stretch of time. Now, obviously, I say this all the time. People think this a lot. But the case of The Bear, like season one, I think the conversation was sustained because people were finding it and hearing about the show because there was not a lot of hype going into it. And it ended up having a longer tail than it probably would have as far as binge shows goes. Season two, I'm a bit skeptical that that would be the case because I think most people who want to watch it, perhaps already watch it all in this past weekend. You know, it's been out about a week now. Um, we'll see. But I, I would, I wish, I wish that was a little differently. Anyway, uh, yeah. So let's just kind of get into like the whole season as a whole. You know, as I said, writing amazing, 
cast amazing what the show is truly interested in beyond the kitchen amazing and then you know i think just episode to episode the bear is just so compelling and it really shows you the highs you can achieve with a 30 minute format you know the bear it'll be nominated in the comedy categories at the emmys and it's a funny show uh consistently funny for sure but also consistently dramatic and it's definitely um you know leaves you with a lot of uh tension as a viewer it's not always a fun watch it, there's a lot of uh agita inducing moments you know it's a very dramatic it's a lot like barry which was run as a comedy but not really a comedy um i think that being said the fact that it's so dramatic in 30 minute chunks again just speaks to i think the the economy of the writing and just the, the vision of, of the whole whole series that it's able to really communicate what it wants to in, in brief chunks you know it's only like I think what nine nine thirty ish minute episodes, and then episode six is an hour long. So that's what six hour season. It, it really gets gets right into it. Episode one and two, you know, kind of really set you off with the the tension of making the new restaurant, the new bear. Um, you know, Tina gets sent to culinary school. There's a lot of tension in the building. You know, uh, finding mold. Uh, we, we figure out sugar is pregnant. Things like that. Um, Sid has a fight with her dad. Um, sitting Carmi or going over the menu, the chaos menu, and that is something that's going to continue and uh, really kind of setting setting the stakes for like what the seasons to come. I believe we're twelve weeks out from their intended open. You know, you get this like big pitch where uh, Richie, Sid, and Carm pitch to Cicero their vision for the new bear and basically begging him to give them the money they need because they don't have enough money even with all the money they found from Mikey, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it just immediately grabs you, right? You know, watching. Um, I think watching the, the kind of desperation that all those characters have and like their vision for the bear and figure out what that vision actually is, but also realizing that this amazing race against the clock. Then very quickly, I believe in episode two, we get introduced to Claire, a figure from Carmi's past, played by Molly Gordon. And Claire is set up uh, and, and delivered on as a love interest later in the season. But a nice bit of like new piece of casting, Molly Gordon. You know, she's in that thing. Shiva Baby. She's been in a few things. Rising actress. Nice, nice addition for sure. Um, you know, episode three, we move, we kind of move right along. Um, you know, building out like the tasting and stuff. The wall falls down. You get that moment of Carmi at a AA meeting. I believe it's the only moment in the season, but just kind of reminding you of, uh, you know, the struggles he has. You know, as, as a person. You know, moving moving forward. Episode four, uh, Sugar's pregnancy gets revealed to the rest of the cast inadvertently. Um, and yeah, what was it? Uh, Marcus gets sent uh, to Sweden. You know, Marcus, the dessert man, needs to hone his craft. I mean, they're really trying to be a Michelin star restaurant. They're trying to up their game. And they send Marcus to Sweden to link up with another figure of Carmi's p- p- uh, career past, played by Will Poulter, our first like big cameo of the season. This episode's directed by Rami Youssef, and I think it's really amazing episode. You know, it's one of those like singular episodes, really only about Marcus, and I think the rapport they have um, as uh, they go through those conversations they have. You know, it's like yes, we're watching like Marcus get good at making these like delectable delights, but hearing from Will Poulter's character about his drive to be the best, and then realizing when he encountered other people in his career that he could never actually be the very very best and that kind of like set him free in a certain sense like the conversations they have are great will poulter is tremendous in the show um you know in, in just this one brief moment really love that episode um you know, i think episode five moving forward um also really tremendous carm and claire go to the party you actually watch carm like be in a social setting and you see how awkward he can be Episode six, of course, will show us why he is the way he is. But like, this is a guy who struggles to do so much in life, and like the tension and chaos of high stakes cooking is like all he knows and all he knows how to be in. And watching him be in a normal setting with Claire, I think, is like really shines. And of course, then he juxtaposed that with Tina going to the bar with her culinary school colleagues singing karaoke. Love it. I really love the line we get from Richie in this episode. He says it a few times where he's like, Richie's trying to find his place in the new bear, you know, as someone who doesn't have a whole lot of like technical skills, especially in the kitchen. And I just love his line. He's like, I'm not 
like this because I'm in Van Halen. I'm in Van Halen because I'm like this. Sounds so good. And just the way Evan Moss Backrack can like imbue that philosophy into Richie, just so great. And of course, episode six, Fish's the hour-long episode. This is the episode that everyone's been talking about because this is like cameo OD. Of course, Bernthal comes back as Mikey, someone we've met before. We also encounter Carmen Mikey's mother, played by Jamie Lee Curtis. Their uh, cousin, I believe, played by Sarah Paulson. Uh, Sarah Paulson's character's husband, played by John Mulaney. Uh, their uncle, played by Bob Odenkirk. Uh, you know, uh, Mikey Matheson's character is there as well. Um, Richie's there with his uh, wife at the time, who we know he's since separated from in the present, um, before she's given birth. Uh, and Carm is there, you know, coming home for Christmas uh, dinner. And kind of a bit estranged from his family as he's gone to pursue being like a high-end chef. And like, it is just, I think, one of those like, Oh, and it's Cicero's there, too. It's just one of those, like, like uh, it, it's a brutal episode to watch. But I think to a lot of people, there's a lot of familiar stuff about that, right? Watching a dysfunctional family exist within itself is familiar, right? I think everyone can relate to having um, blow-ups, having dark moments around holiday meals, around holiday times. It's definitely relatable uh, in one way or another. And that's an episode where you have like these big, like you cannot stop watching the screen moments, like where Mikey is about to actually explode at Bob Odenkirk's uncle character and throw the fork again, like that, like tension at the table that the characters feel. You feel it too, as if you were, that shit's crazy. But also like the smaller moments, like when Carm and Mikey connect in like the closet and Carm gives him the drawing and you just see how overwhelmed Mikey is, even though he doesn't know what to do in that moment, um, the moment upstairs between Richie and, uh, you know, his wife, pregnant wife with the Sprite, like the conversation they have, like there's, I think a lot like laid out in this episode. And I think probably the most showy thing of all, we Jamie Lee Curtis as the mom who is, is really struggling with the pressure and tension of in this moment, like handling the kitchen and delivering the kitchen, the, the Christmas meal. And like, you just see how, where, you know, Carm and Mikey got so fucked up. You know, this is a, a family that struggled with substances, perhaps has mental illness involved, you know, perhaps there's some infidelity. It's a bit hinted at in the episode, a bit unclear. Like, there's a lot of baggage and, I think, weariness with this family. And it, it's a it's both a flashy and showy episode due to the cameos. Um, and that makes it entertaining in its own right. But... It also, I think, is such a essential piece of flashback because it shows you how Carm is the way he is. Like you understand where he got it from, and it's not as hokey as like this is why Carm decided to be the best chef. No, it's not even like that. It's not. As, it can't. It can never be that neat. That's not what this show does. But you know, kind of watching like Carm's tension amongst his own family. His and he's most serene in this episode when he's trying to help his mom. In amidst her uh, very busy uh, kitchen timeline, you know, tremendous episode. I really liked it. Some people have been a bit down on the Jamie Lee Curtis performance. It's, it's definitely over the top for like an over the top type of person. Didn't bother me. I, th- I, th- I thought it was really cool. Mulaney though really jumps off the screen. It's easily his most dramatic bit of acting he's like ever really done. And he has like a great moment when he does uh, the toast, you know, at the table. I thought he was really great. And Odenkirk. We know how good he is. He's great. Paulson a bit underutilized, but it's cool watching Sarah Paulson not just like do a Ryan Murphy like OD times a thousand character. That's great. And of course, Bernthal, like I said in the in the pantry scene, he's amazing. But just like this is just like one of the great actors we have right now. He's so amazing, and him as Mikey feels so real, so realized, even though it's been ninety minutes of total screen time on a TV show, like that's all it is. And yet it, it, it's so, so full, so rich as a performance. So good. Episode seven, Forks. This, like the Marcus going to Sweden episode, this is another character episode where Richie gets sent to a like five star or, or whatever it is, like high end Michelin restaurant at Carm's behest. And he kind of like, I forget the title, but he like, he follows around and like kind of picks up on how they operate. And he sees the precision and, fanatical devotion to the job 
and he connects with uh, this character Garrett about like why they are the way they are like make have making people's night who are so excited to be there and that kind of fuels the all out like obsession with doing the job as well as they possibly can culminating with another cameo in this case the uh, chef Terry the head of this restaurant that Richie's been at for a week we learn that Jeff Terry is played by none other than the great Olivia Coleman and uh, Terry and Richie have just a really honest, you know, heart to heart connection while uh, I believe uh, peeling some potatoes or whatever it was in the start to start the day. And that's a, just, I think a fantastic episode for Richie for Evan Moss Backrat. You know, this is overall a quieter, more subdued season from him. He was definitely a flashy blow up kind of character in season one. And it was amazing at that. But like now the character has like it really experienced some real growth in this kind of episode, I think just amazingly shines loved it and earlier on i never saw this coming earlier on there's a great moment where richie's you know spending time with his daughter you know again as a separated parent and he says a really funny line that i'm sure plenty of people relate to which is like uh, and da- daddy loves taylor swift honey he just needed a break hilarious line great stuff to expect from the bear just n- nice piece of writing but then at the end of episode seven forks richie is felt so fulfilled he's singing uh, was it, I believe You Belong With Me by Taylor Swift as he's speeding his car back home. He's so filled with jubilation. Just an hilarious moment, hilarious needle drop. This is a show filled with great needle drops, but like to pay off the Taylor Swift comment from episode two back with this like jubilant Taylor Swift drop at the end of an episode, uh, I, th- I thought it was like note perfect, really, really well done. Loved it. And then before you know it, the show is almost over, right? Episode eight, we're two weeks out, 10 weeks out. There's to 10 days out. There's a pressure with the fire test, getting some new hires done. Uh, you know, episode nine, the focus on, uh, I, I loved um, Marcus showing the desserts to Carm and Sid. Um, you know, and then culminating with episode 10, where they had the soft opening as like a test for everyone, um, you know, in their new iteration as a restaurant. This final stretch, I think, is really great because you have, I think, this tension, this disconnect between Sid and Carm, and Sid feeling like Carm is giving her his full attention. Carm finally, at the end, realizing that, but also realizing that because he's giving attention to his, you know, this budding romance with Claire, he's not giving his full attention, his full focus to the restaurant. And he just seems like he's a kind of guy who can't. Uh, compartmentalize his life and it ends and I, th- I think the whole episode like episode 10 the finale where they go through this test you know obviously things go wrong and they go through it I really love the way it first starts filming you like following various characters walking in and out of the kitchen things seem to be going well then things don't go well where and Carmen gets locked in the fridge because he never got the fridge door fixed something that was shown throughout the season just because he had a really bad time management a- as a person and Carm kind of come into this realization, he ends up venting out his fears over splitting his life between Claire and the bear and in, in inadvertently doing that to Claire. They seem to separate. She calls him back later. Um, I'm sure this will have plenty of meat left on the bone at the start of season three. But then very quickly, you have this fight through the fridge door between Richie and Carm. And Carm's anger really getting the best of him once again. You know, and I think it's a really great place to leave you because once again for the most part very successful day for the bear as a restaurant the bear as a staff and yet in their personal lives there's still a lot of broken things to be mended and again just kind of speaks to like where the priorities of the bear really lie i think why this show is just so tremendous so great you know we love season two like i said i think it's my number two show of the year thus far beyond succession season four and but leave a comment let me know how'd you feel about the bear how'd you like season two compared to season one um did you wish it came out at a slower pace week to week like me and you know for i'll talk about the emmys we'll see what bear season one looks like for noms in a few weeks check in for that of course i'll be talking about the bear again with the top 10 at the end of the year i have no doubt and for more tv reviews subscribe and I'll see you next time. What's up? Welcome back to Nostalgia. Dave here with a review of Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, the fifth and final Indiana Jones film, starring, of course, Harrison Ford in the title role 
This is our first Indiana Jones film since 2008's Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. It's been 15 years. And this is also our first Indiana Jones movie without Steven Spielberg at the helm. This, of course, is directed by James Mangold instead, who is a really great choice for something like this, given his pedigree both in uh, franchise films like Logan and the Wolverine, as well as more dramatic fare like Ford vs. Ferrari, Western fare like 310 to Yuma. Incredible director, one of my favorites. And yeah, it's been a while. Harrison Ford is at this current time, 80 years old, made this movie when he was like 78. It's the final go round for Indy and the gang. And I have to say, I'm happy to say I really like the movie. I thought it was a kind of a blast most of the time. It's long, for sure. There's quibbles to make about the length. But for the final like send-off installment, I thought it was a very effective send-off for the character and for Ford. And I think you could make a case that's the third best indie movie over uh, Temple of Doom. I probably wouldn't. I would say it's four. But I think it's definitely better than Kingdom of Crystal Skull. And that's kind of all I needed this movie to be, to be a success for me. But I genuinely really liked it. Um, I think just, you know, kind of right off the bat, like, it's interesting to to reflect on this, like, late period of Harrison Ford, right? Harrison Ford, one of the signature movie stars of all time, you know, his run in the mid-70s through, like, 19, early 90s, you know, the pre-Tom Hanks movie star run was occupied by Harrison Ford. It's a kind of undeniable run of films. And a big part of that was, of course, his role as Han Solo and his role as Indiana Jones and also his role as a Deckard in Blade Runner. And Harrison Ford has returned to all three of those roles in the last, you know, eight years. And I think this is some of the best acting late period Ford has given us. Obviously, he's the star of Battle of Destiny. He is not the star of Star Wars The Force Awakens or Blade Runner 2049. But I think Ford's really good in Dial of Destiny, and it's been cool to see him kind of nod to his famous roles of the past and have those go off into the sunset, if you will, like at the end of Last Crusade. And that's been great. Kind of surprised that Harrison Ford's still continuing to pursue big roles after this, like he's replacing William Hurt in Marvel um, for next year's Captain America movie. I thought 80-year-old Ford would kind of just want to be chilling smoking weed, flying planes, but I don't know. He must like the work. But yeah, Dial Destiny, big fan. Uh, and let's get into why. I think there's a lot to get into with this movie. This is the latest set uh, in, in like you know in time indie film. It's set in 1969. Um, and it starts off, though, with this big uh, flashback sequence. Quite a long set piece in... Where else? World War II. Once again, our villains are Nazis. The signature uh, villain of the Indiana Jones fil- uh, films, of course. The two best Indiana Jones movies, Raiders and Last Crusade, both have Nazis as villains. This one does once again as well. And you have this really like long, uh, uh, you know, scene in the past where Indies, uh, you know, pursuing uh, an artifact, the Holy Lance. Uh, from Nazis towards the end of World War II and it has you know kind of ends with this big train sequence. I think it's really really good, really good quality set piece and features perhaps like the best de-aging technology we've ever got to this point. Obviously that's a technology that's getting better and better, but it was really good like de-aged Harrison Ford. I think the quibble you can make about this scene is just that it's a bit unnecessary. It is a good set piece for sure. Um, and it introduces you to Toby Jones's character, a colleague of Indiana Jones, whose daughter, played by Phoebe Waller-Bridge, of course, plays a big uh, role in the present-day stuff with Dial of Destiny's plot. But you, the quibble you could make with this opening set piece is that you could cut this like almost 20 minutes and maybe give you some exposition in, in the present day in some other manner, really to set up Phoebe Waller-Bridge, to set up our antagonist, and the movie would have been shorter. I'm sympathetic to that. But again, I thought it was a good enough set piece. I liked it. It's okay to leave it in for me. But I understand that like we could have technically probably cut this and not have lost too much with the actual film. That's okay though. Um, it also couldn't help but be like a nod to me to like the original, you know, rumored like theme of what the fifth Indiana Jones movie was going to be about. This set piece is about, or you know, culminates with a Nazi loot train trying to escape 
uh, you know, into further into Europe. And the original, you know, uh, Jonathan Kasdan script that was not used for Indiana Jones 5 involved Indy's pursuit of a lost, you know, buried in the mountain Nazi gold train, Nazi loot train, which is a famous, you know, like historical myth people have always thought about and dreamed about. It's kind of cool to see like a, a kind of like loose acknowledgement of that appear in the set piece. I at least, it, you know, made my eyebrows raise. That was cool. And also this set, this flashback does a good job for us of setting up the villain of the, the film, uh, Hürgen Wohler, a Nazi uh, scientist character uh, played by who other? Mads Mikkelsen. Perhaps the greatest villain actor we have working these days. He definitely knows how to play a bad guy. And spoiler alert, shockingly, he's really good once again as a bad guy in Indiana Jones 5. I liked it. Um, it also, of course, sets us up for what the Chief MacGuffin will be in Dial of Destiny, the titular Dial of Destiny. No, it's not the Holy Grail, once again. It's not the Ark of the Covenant. It is the Dial of Destiny, a.k.a. the Antith- Antithicara. Sorry, it's kind of hard to say that one. The Antithicara, which is a ancient Greek relic created by Archimedes, which was kind of like the first analog computer. It kind of tracked um, stuff in the sky and like space movements and things like that. And that is our artifact, which is cool. It's like a real thing that was actually being used as our MacGuffin in this film. And in general, one of the things I've always liked about the Indiana Jones movie, despite the fact that they're the best ones are incredibly well-made, you know, action adventure films. And because they're made by Steven Spielberg, features just amazing set pieces that live to this day. I also am a big fan of historical fiction. I like real world villains in the case of the Nazis. I like seeing Indiana Jones do things in and around history. And, you know, because George Lucas helped conceive a lot of stuff in Indiana Jones, you have really fun premises to the more supernatural and science fiction aspects of the Indiana Jones stories. And I think the Antithicara fits right into that. A lineage of what's good about Indiana Jones, you know, plots. So all that really works for me. And then we go to 1969 and we get old Indiana Jones and we learn that Hergen Voller, Mads Mikkelsen's character, he's now one of the, of course, Operation Paperclip Nazis who ended up working for NASA and being used for good, quote unquote. And he, of course, is seeking into the Kara. Once again, which is split, split to uh, protect itself, et cetera, et cetera. Details, details. And the race soon becomes on, and we're, we quickly encounter Phoebe Waller Bridges, Helena Shaw character, the daughter of Toby Jones from the flashback. I think Phoebe Waller Bridges is freaking fantastic in this movie. Obviously, I've been a big fan of hers ever since Fleabag. She's really proven herself as a comedic performer and something like that, as well as just an amazing writer, Fleabag. One of the best shows of the last 10 years. But also, Phoebe Waller-Bridge has been really in demand doing key script punch-up work on No Time to Die, for example. Getting that big Amazon overall deal that she hasn't put anything out for really yet, but she's such a talent. And I think her writing maybe overshadows just how great an actor she is as well at times. I think she really fit in well, had great chemistry with Harrison Ford, acquitted herself well in the action scenes and the set pieces, fit right in. She clearly can do a type of like action adventure blockbuster film. You know, obviously she's not going to become the new Indiana Jones, but she can do something similar. I think she's clearly proved herself in this movie. I thought she was awesome. Um, And before you know it, we get a lot of awesome classic jet setting, like some of the best Indiana Jones films. Once again, a lot of the shot location as well. We get this really fun stuff uh, in Morocco and Tangier. The Tuk Tuk, you know, car chase. Great. Really awesome. Really ripping. You know, obviously it's a big, uh, I think, you know, bar to cl- uh, uh, hit when it comes to car chases and, and car scenes. In the Indiana Jones, you have the end of the Raiders chase scene, which is iconic. You have the tank stuff in Last Crusade. Uh, even the blimp stuff in Last Crusade. Vehicles are a big part of th- th- this this franchise. I think the Tuk Tuk stuff was great. Uh, we quickly go to, what is it, Greece? Yeah, Greece, Sicily. I forgot the order of these. We go to Greece or Sicily, and we meet Antonio Banderas' character. We did underwater stuff. Really fun, I think, sight gad and nod 
to acknowledge Indiana Jones's fear of snakes via him encountering eels underwater. I thought that was pretty clever, pretty fun. And then we go to from Greece slash Sicily. We go to the other one, and uh, we kind of get another like kind of like classic like going into a tomb and solving the stuff. It's a lot of like it's a lot of indie tropes that you know, but like, I think like it's done so warmly and winningly. And I think overall, broadly, like the movie is effective at everything it's portraying. That like to me, it's okay that some of this plotting is a bit familiar to the franchise. I think that's totally fine. Because it's just such a great time the entire time. Um, and I think the big, um, I think probably the, the best aspect of Harrison Ford's acting in this would be the moment he has, I believe he's telling it to uh, Shaw, I don't, he's, whoever he says it to, but yeah, it must be Shaw, where he basically acknowledges why Shia LaBeouf's Mutt Williams character, Indiana Jones' son, why from King of the Crystal Skull, why Mutt's not in the film. We learn that Mutt actually enlisted in vietnam to kind of get back at his dad to make him mad and he he died he died in the war and that that loss that grief actually is what drove marion and indiana jones away and kind of broke their marriage because in the beginning of the present day stuff we learned that uh, indiana jones is alone and the way ford communicates that scene is great um really some of the best stuff he's done in these big movies in a while. You know, I think, I think Ford's pretty good in Force Awakens acting as well, but like that scene's probably like the, what you'd hold up as like some of the best stuff that like Ford has done in any of the big movies he's done lately. And that'll get paid off at the end of the movie. But I thought that was like a really great moment. And, you know, leading that in, you have um, the movie really kind of kicking off into um the deep end, you could say, really going extreme, right? Like, wh- what happens in these movies? Ultimately, there's always a sci-fi element, right? The Ark of the Covenant is, in fact, real. And the power of God will smite the, you know, enemies of the Lord. In this case, he'll melt the fucking faces off of Nazis, right? Holy Grail is, in fact, real. And per the Grail myth that was concocted, you know, years later, it does have the power to grant everlasting life as evidenced by a literal knight from the crusades living in the presence of the grail to this day right sci-fi stuff is a big aspect of indiana jones well they push that to the absolute limit because what is the ant of the care the dial of destiny being thought of as like why why is it being sought this historical artifact that exists in real life but what is like the magical quality of dial of destiny is none other than the ability to find time fissures and go back in time yeah, fucking time travel movie, man. Pat- multiple timelines. This is a storytelling device that we cannot escape in major movies. We have talked ad nauseum about the multiverse and timelines. This very summer with The Flash and Spider-Verse 2, it, it's very much on the mind. And somehow Indiana Jones 5 is joining the party with time travel. I would never have guessed it. But honestly, I think it really worked well. And it was really cool too. Is like Jurgen Voller, our villain. His motivation I thought was awesome. He wants to go back in time to World War II, but he wants to go kill Hitler. And I'm like, huh, compelling. But why does he want to kill Hitler? Not for good. No, the, not, the, not the classic kill Hitler to you know stop stop the atrocities of history. No, Voller wants to kill Hitler so that the Nazis can win and Hitler's mistakes during the war won't be made. It's like, wow, that's cool. And I thought where this movie was going to go, when we realized they are in fact going to go back in time, I thought Ford would have to realize that he had let Voller kill Hitler to like you know not mess up the timeline, the canon events per Spider Verse's terminology, right? I thought that's where we were going to go, but it doesn't actually go that way, which is fine. And what ends up happening is they try and go back in time, and which is really I think a really fun build up to that with like uh, air, 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 airplane travel to get there when we get to go back in time they go back to the wrong part in time they don't go back to like you know the 40s they go back to ancient greece at the siege of syracuse and we actually meet in the flesh archimedes himself the creator of the dial the creator of Antithecara, our MacGuffin in the film and that's how the dial gets brought 
to into the uh, to Archimedes who hadn't finished making the dial at the time they traveled back to it. it's like ah oh, it's one of those closing of the loop quote unquote with, with the time travel stuff but you also I think get some really poignant stuff where like Indiana Jones wants to stay he wants to end his life because he he's uh, been uh, wounded at this point he wants to stay and kind of live out his last moments of life in history as it's taking place you know and speak to Archimedes because he knows ancient Greece Greek because it's Indiana Jones uh, he wants to spend his last moments doing that and I was like you know what that actually is incredibly in sync with the character and Ford gives a really committed like you know line readings in that moment that was really working for me and I thought that would have been an amazing send off if they had decided to do that but no Shaw forces uh, Indy to come back they go back to their times because they don't belong in this past which is probably good for the timelines and the canon events, as we all know, because we, God, we think about the, t- the multiverse a lot these days. And what happens? None other than an absolutely moving and touching final scene where Marion, Karen Allen, returning to the franchise, Marion comes back and uh, Indiana Jones wakes up to Marion coming back and they kind of embrace and seemingly agree to you know live out the rest of their days together once again. And I thought it was just a really nice, warm send-off for the character, for Ford in many ways as a, you know, movie star of our times. And I, I just really enjoyed the movie. I thought it was good. Things, other other notes, I thought Boyd Holbrook kind of wasted as like the secondary villain, the heavy of Voller. Um, Holbrook's a good actor, an engaging actor, and the script just doesn't give him a whole lot to do in Dial of Destiny, which feels like they, they wasted him a bit. Um, Banderas has a small role you know, during the diving scene. Um, good for what he does, but whatever. Um, oh, you have the um, the youthful sidekick of uh, Shaw, played by uh, Teddy, played by Ethan Isidore. I liked him a lot. I thought he was pretty good. Obviously, it's a nod to Short Round and Temple of Doom, but it's another good use of a you know child character. Um, what else? Oh, we have Jonathan Rhys Davies return in a small moment as a Sala. Of course, you know, Indy sidekick and Raiders and Lost, Last Crusade. Notably, Jonathan Reese davies not an Egyptian man, playing an Egyptian. Certainly, he would not be cast in that role today. I don't know if it's necessarily like an offensive portrayal of, an, you know, someone playing some, some other race. So, him coming back is not the worst thing in the world. We know it wouldn't happen today, and it's the last time it's going to happen. I think we can let it slide. And I do like Jonathan Reese davies a lot. Obviously, I'm a big Lord of the Rings fan. I love him as Gimli. He's really fun as Sala. Uh, just the uh, indie, you know, the way the, the way, he, way he speaks, the gregarious presence he has. I, I do enjoy Sala, I must say. Um, yeah. Best knee aging we've ever had, I think, is in the beginning of this movie. That's no small feat to me. I like Dial of Destiny. I think it's the fourth best Indiana Jones movie, but not too far behind three. It's a really good time. And, you know, a lot's been made about the box office with this film. Box office coming in soft. This movie having a gigantic budget due to its location shooting, its uh, de-aging CGI, CG, other CGI use. Expensive movie to make. Made even more so by the fact that Harrison Ford got injured on set, which ran up costs while he had to recover movie was made during COVID, which added additional costs. Expensive movie to make, over $300 million. There was really no world where this movie would have made enough money to gross and justify that big of a budget on the business side of things. It's not going to happen. I don't really care about that, though. Movie's good. I'm happy with it. And, hey, if Disney has to take a loss in the box office... I think this will be a movie that people will like and it'll be a fixture on Disney Plus and yeah, they'll take the loss, but like, I don't know, this was a really fun time, I think a creatively worthwhile use of, of that money. So, yeah. I think people sometimes, we, sometimes, and I'm certainly guilty of it, we get hung up on the box office and the, the yeses and the noes when it comes to things earning enough. And sometimes we also have to just think about the creative side of things and that um, it's okay sometimes, you know? And I think for everyone else who, everyone who made this movie, 
you know, and being in the movie, uh, there's really no skin off their back. So, alas, we've had two big bombs lately, uh, to varying degrees, with The Flash and Indiana Jones 5, and even a little while ago, Shazam 2. We've had some bombs this year. We've also had some hits. Uh, it, it'll be okay. Uh, but yeah, let me know. How did you feel about Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny? Long movie. Did you feel it was a fitting conclusion to wrap up the way I did? Uh, and for more movie reviews, subscribe. And I'll see you next time. What's up? Welcome back to Nostalgia. Dave here with my 2023 Emmy nominations predictions. These Emmy nominations are going to come out on July 12th. I had to make sure I get these out, talk about what's going down. Of course, the Emmys are going to happen on uh, September 18th. The voting is closed, so pretty soon we'll know what's up. These uh, eligible shows are from June 1st, 2022, till May 31st of this year, 2023. So a whole year's worth of time once again. And there was one key change to how the Emmy voting is going down this year, which I think will have a positive impact on the Emmys. That would be that it is no longer a vote for as many nominees as you feel are deserving type prompt. It is actually a fixed number of nominees for categories. And this is good because the kind of unlimited approach that we had in the past few years had an unintended effect of gravitating towards a smaller number of really popular shows getting a lot of nominations. Look at Succession's cast, Ted Lasso's cast, just kind of running it up, right? That's because people love those shows just kind of kind of build, build, up, uh, build up in a populist way. When you fix it out, uh, fix the number of nominees, people are going to naturally gravitate towards spreading the wealth, trying to recognize more. And I think it'll be positive for recognizing more shows which is, I think, good and, and what we want to see the Emmys do. So looking forward to seeing how that bears out, but I think it'll be good. But yeah, let's just kind of get into it, right? We got three categories, comedy, drama, limited series. So I'm going to go through the series noms as well as actor, actress, supporting actor, supporting actor. So let's go through the big categories here, and then I'll be reacting to the actual nominations when they come out uh, on July 12th. And of course, I'll be doing my actual Emmy predictions uh, in September before the awards actually happen. So make sure you come back for that and subscribe. Uh, yeah, so let's go into a comedy series. So I think comedy series is actually pretty strong this year. It was pretty thin during the pandemic as less stuff was available, but it's really come around this year. You have Ted Lasso, Abbott Elementary, The Bear, Only Murders in the Building, Barry, Wednesday, Shrinking, Marvel System, Maisel, Poker Face, and What We Do in the Shadows. I think that's like a pretty consistent top 10. You know, Lasso, Abbott, previous winners, Maisel, previous winner back in the day. Barry, uh, winner winner of categories in the past. Brand new newcomer with a lot of credit adulation in the bear showing up. Um, Apple with another show they want to put their money behind with Shrinking. Wednesday, absolutely huge hit for Netflix, right? Poker Face, one of the biggest hits Peacock has ever had. And of course, something very consistent, arguably the funniest show of them all, What We Do in the Shadows. I think it's a really good mix. Um, you know, I, th I don't really know if anything can really crack that in there besides Atlanta. The final season of Atlanta is technically in the mix here. I'm, uh, I'm a bit skeptical if it'll actually get through, though. You know, I thought Atlanta season four is actually amazing. Um, you know, probably the second best Atlanta season. But I don't know. It feels like it's a bit muted on that front, which is a bit uh, un, uh, undeserved, no, no doubt. It was one of, my, one of the best shows of last year. Atlanta is one of the best shows of the last 10 years. I would definitely take out Only Murders in the Building for Atlanta, but we'll see if that actually happens. Reservation Dogs, Rami, I'm not sure if that's going to happen. Um, I know some people like Dave, The Great, Dead to Me, Jury Duty, a newcomer. I, I don't really see any of that happening. So I think it'd be pretty predictable. I think the one thing to watch is, does Atlanta get in? And is there any other surprise for comedy series? Moving on to comedy actress, also a really nice category because you have the past winner, Quinta Brunson, coming up against a previous winner as well, Rachel Brosnahan for Maisel, newcomer with Jenna Ortega and Wednesday, Natasha Leone for Peacock. And then the last spot, I don't know, is it Selena Gomez for Only Murders? Is it Ella Fanning for The Graves, but nominated in the past? I'm not too sure. I think it's the battle of King Brunson versus Rachel Brosnahan. And considering Maisel's like critical and popular like overall wane and, and dip, I think it's pretty easy that King Brunson's going to run this back and get recognized once again. But Natasha Leone would be a nice win because... You know, much like Russian Doll, Peacock is another example of showcase for her as an actor. I like that category. Comedy actor uh, is really impressive. You had Jeremy Allen White for The Bear, Sudeikis, previous winner for Ted Lasso, Bill Hader, previous winner for Barry, Steve Martin and Martin Short for Only Murders, 
And then the last one, Donald Glover for Atlanta, the previous winner. Could it be Jason Siegel for Shrinking? Could it be one of the What We Do in the Shadows cast? Probably not, but that'd be nice. Really stacked. I, I would love Jeremy Allen White to win this, considering he hasn't won before. Uh, he's going up against previous winners, and it's just a tour de force performance in the Bears. Super deserving. I would really be rooting for that. So we'll see. Uh, comedy supporting actress, also pretty impressive. Cheryl Lee Ralph, the previous winner for Abbott. Hannah Waddingham, a previous winner for Ted Lasso. Iowa Ibiri for The Bear. Uh, Janelle James for Abbott. And then perhaps Alex Borstein, previous winner for Maisel. Uh, Sarah Goldberg in the mix for Barry. Juno Temple in the mix for Ted Lasso. Pretty solid. Um, I'll be rooting for Iowa Ibiri, for sure, with The Bear. But that's a nice category. Tommy Supporting Actor. Tyler James Williams for Abbott, previous winner. Brett Goldstein for Ted Lasso, previous winner. Henry Winkler for Barry, previous winner. Anthony Kerrigan for Barry. Last spot, could it be Tony Shalhoub, previous nominee for Maisel? Evan Moss Baccarat for The Bear, would love it. Nick Muhammad, previous nominee for Ted Lasso. Harrison Ford for Shrinking? Not sure. I'm not really sure about that last one. I don't have a good feel for that. I'm really confident the top four will get in there, though. Um... And in terms of who I'm rooting for, I'm not really sure. I, I'd be happy with any of those. I'm really rooting for Edmund Moss background, I think. It's a lot of bear love for me right now. That's comedy. Drama series. Uh, of course, the, the big dog here. Succession. White Lotus. Last of Us. House of the Dragon. That's four HBO heavy hitters. <laughs> Crazy. Better Call Saul. Season 6, the second half. Remember, that was split up. The first half of Season 6 was in the last Emmy period. The second half was in this Emmy period. They kind of did the chicanery with that, but it, it's within the rules. So the last chance for Saul to win anything is this year. So second half still all season six. The Crown, the previous, the most recent season. Yellow Jacket season two. Andor in the mix. Yellowstone in the mix. Things that I would love to see but won't happen. Industry season two on HBO. That'd be amazing. Uh, the Boys in the mix for season three. Uh, Mandalorian season three, probably not. Rings of Power on Amazon, probably not. 1923, the Ellison spinoff, probably also worth considering here. Although I, I feel like they're running that in drama, even though it's a limited series. So that's um, a bit, bit strange. But anyway, yeah, I think it. I mean, it's going to be Succession for sure. But it'll be curious like what the, the last half of the nominees are. But I, I think House of the Dragon will get in, and it'll just be four HBO bangers, basically, back to back to back to back. Um, obviously, Saul would be awesome if Saul could have won this. But alas, Succession Season 4 is going to take no prisoners, I think. Drama Actress... Sarah Snook for Succession, my fave for sure. Melanie Linsky for uh, Yellow Jackets, previous winner. Bella Ramsey, newcomer with The Last of Us. Imelda uh, Staunton, who's the new latest Queen Elizabeth in The Crown. Emma Darcy for House of the Dragon. I think that's the five, but Elizabeth Moss is still in the mix for Handmaids. Carrie Russell with The Diplomat on Netflix, which is very popular. I, I would not sleep on that happening. Also, Helen Mirren, 1923. I feel like that's that's the mix, that's the pool here. I kind of have a feeling Carrie Russell could sneak in here over, maybe over Melda Staunton, even though Crown has been strong with the Emmys in the past. Maybe over Emma Darcy. I'm not sure, but I'm pretty confident Snook, Linsky, and Ramsey are there. Drama actors, very loaded. Jeremy Strong, Succession. Bob Odenkirk, The Last Half of Saul. Kieran Culkin, Succession. Pedro Pascal, Last of Us. Brian Cox, Succession. Jeff Bridges for The Old Man. Patty Considine, House of the Dragon, Diego Luna, Andor, Harrison Ford, 1923, Anthony Starr is my dream pick for the boys. That won't happen. Uh, yeah, I think Strong, Odenkirk, Culkin, Pascal are definitely in. Cox is probably a definite two, but he has such a small role in Succession Season 4 that, I don't know, could Disney get Diego Luna in there? Probably not. And I think HBO would run Cox over Patty Considine. Although this is Patty Constantine's like one chance to get nominated for House of the Dragon. That would be kind of nice. I thought he was great. But yeah, I think Cox will get in there. I have no problem with Succession running it up. It shows that good. Drama Supporting Actress. This one's also quite stacked. Jennifer Coolidge for White Lotus. Aubrey Plaza for White Lotus. And Megan Fahey for White Lotus. I think at least two of those are getting in there. Maybe Fahey doesn't, but Coolidge and Plaza definitely in. Reese Seahorn for The Last Bit of Saul. Elizabeth Debicki for The Crown as Princess Diana. J. Smith Cameron for Succession. Um, I think that's the mix. I would love Olivia Cook to get in here for House of the Dragon. She would be my number one choice of any House of the Dragon cast member. We'll see. Uh, Christina Ricci is also here for Yellow Jackets in the mix. <sighs> I'm not too sure. I think maybe J. Smith Cameron doesn't get in with the new Emmy voting, and Succession doesn't run up that many noms in terms of cast, but I don't know. It feels like it's possible, but 
I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if we need three White Lotus noms in one category. We'll see. But I think that's the mix. Drama supporting actor, Matthew McFadden for succession, Nick Braun for succession, Alan Ruck for succession. Feeling good about all three of those, to be honest. Giancarlo Esposito uh, in the mix here. First of all, F. Murray Abraham for White Lotus, given the controversy, um, you know, in terms of allegations against F. Murray Abraham. Maybe that doesn't happen anymore for White Lotus. That would leave open Matt Smith in House of the Dragon or Alexander Skarsgård uh, in Succession. I'd be rooting for Skarsgård. I think it's one of his best performances in his whole career. That'd be sick. Although that would be four Succession people in the category, which feels tough. It's a great Connor Roy season, so I think Alan Ruck is really deserving. I don't believe he got nominated every single time in the past. Uh, man, they're all so good. I mean, McFadden has to win. He, he's, as Tom, like he was that good in Succession. He's my pick. I wouldn't mind taking Esposito out, given he's been nominated plenty of times in the past. No problem with me. I um, also want to know, guest actor in a drama has some really interesting choices this year. You have Murray Bartlett and Nick Offerman from that one episode of The Last of Us, and also Andy Serkis from Andor. I would love it if any of those win. I'm probably going to bet on Offerman being the winner there. And then lastly, we have limited series. I think this is a bit weaker year for limited series, for miniseries in general. It's often stacked, but I don't know. Just I wasn't as grabbed by the, th- this crop as I had been in the past. You have Monster, the Jeffrey Dahmer story on Netflix, um, which is a monster hit, of course. Beef on Netflix, one of my favorite shows of the year. It's my favorite thing in the category by far. Blackbird on Apple. Fleischman in Trouble on FX and Hulu. Daisy Jones and the Six on Amazon. I think that's the five. I mean, in the mix, you have uh, George and Tammy, not super critically adored. The English on Amazon. I don't know if that's popular enough. White House Plumbers on HBO didn't really make the noise people thought. And then you have Swarm on Amazon Prime, Mrs. Davis on Peacock. I think those shows are a bit too weird to out there to get nominated. Those are probably two of the most interesting picks you can make and probably deserve to be there. Um, you know, a show like Obi-Wan Kenobi wasn't liked enough to break through here. So I'd love to see like Swarm and Mrs. Davis get in there, but I don't know. It's, it's a bit of a nothing category. I didn't love Daisy Jones and the Six. Monsters, Ryan Murphy was popular, but you know. Fleischman in Trouble people liked. Blackbird I think is fine. Beef is my pick for sure. I'm rooting for Beef. That's that. Limited Actress, you have Chastain from George and Tammy, Emily Blunt for The English, Ali Wong for Beef, my pick, Riley Keough, Daisy Jones and the Six. And the last one, I don't know, Elizabeth Olsen, Love and Death, which is, I guess, in the mix for limited series, technically. Rachel Weiss for Dead Ringers, again, a show that I think is a bit too weird to break through, but you never know. I don't know. I think there'll be some surprises with that one. Limited Actor, I think there's a lot of, like, big names in the mix. Evan Peters for Dahmer, Taryn Edgerton for Blackbird. Steven Yeun for Beef, my guy. Michael Shannon for George and Tammy. Daniel Radcliffe for the Weird Al thing. <laughs> Sam Clayfin for Daisy Jones. Probably not. People didn't like that performance, but I don't know. Jesse Eisenberg for Fleischman. Woody Harrelson for White House Plumbers. Um, yeah, not really too sure Like, like where that's going to go. I'd love Steven Yeun to win, but I don't have a good feel for this one at all. In general, like I said, I think it's a bit of a weaker year. Uh, Limited Supporting Actress, Niecy Nash for Monster, Every Dahmer Story, uh, Claire Danes for Fleischman, Aria Bello for Beef, maybe, Olivia Coleman for Great Expectations, I guess, Ashley Park for Beef, I don't know, that one seems incredibly thin, so that also is room for surprise, and I don't have a good feel for that one either. Limited Supporting Actor, maybe a little bit better, Paul Walter Hauser for Blackbird, Ray Liotta for Blackbird. People like Paul Walter Hauser. He's great. Maybe that's the favorite there. You have Jeffrey, uh, Richard Jenkins for Jeffrey Dahmer. Donald Gleason for The Patient. I don't know. Like, I think Limited is a big crapshoot. And it's usually not like that. You know, Limited is often very stacked, especially because a lot of shows that start out as limited series run in, in that category in their first season, like The White Lotus, for example. And they become an uh, ongoing series after that, and then it changes. So we just don't really have a show that feels like that right now. Like Monster will continue, but not about Jeffrey Dahmer, so it's totally fine to be in that category, and it does seem like Beef is, in fact, a limited series. So, alas, there we are. I think drama, very stacked, even if it's probably a bit of a, uh, you know, easy to read where that's going with Succession. Comedy, though, I think there's a bit more room for change, and Limited, I think, is a grab shoot. So, we'll see what happens with the nominations on July 12th, but let me know who do you really want to see nominated, who are you worried that won't get nominated, that you really want to win, for me, shout out industry. Uh, that's my number one like 
pick for sure that I don't think is going to get much of anything, but really deserves. It was my number two show last year. Uh, last year we are. But yeah, check in on July 12th when I do the reactions. Let me know what you think. And for more Emmy talk, more TV reviews, subscribe. And I'll see you next time. All right, that's going to do it for the pod this week. Next week, going to catch up on two shows I've been meaning to get to that I've just had to get had to, had, had to make time for. I'm a Virgo on Amazon Prime from Boots Riley and the latest season of Black Mirror on Netflix. Also, new music from Dominic Fike and EXO, as well as the new comedy film Joyride. So a lot of stuff to be excited about next week. Make sure you subscribe. Hit the links below. Linktree.com slash NostalgiaPod. YouTube.com slash NostalgiaPod. Hit the Spotify playlist in the links below. Let me know it's good. And I'll see you next week. Yeah.